I'm Kevin. Uh, I come at this from maybe a different direction from a lot of folks. I'm a mechanical engineer originally. Spend a, a lot of time working with folks uh, doing mechatronics, uh, which meant I built a bunch of enclosures, prototyping. Uh, the last 20 years I've been at Autodesk, part of the Fusion 360 team, uh, and in the last two years uh, I've been doing a lot more of uh, ad hoc prototyping along with Matt, who will be doing a presentation tomorrow, uh, and figured it would be a, a great opportunity to sit and share some of the, the tricks we've learned over the last uh, couple of years on how to quickly bang out uh, prototyping and, and quick enclosures. So we're going to look at this from a bunch of different directions. Um, I'm sure every one of us has done this before, you know, tying, soldering, prototyping, kept on tape to prevent things from shorting out, all of this uh, you know, in the expedience drives necessity here. So um, we may have bought enclosures to cram things in, but what we really want to do is just get simple enclosures, simple rigs uh, banged out really fast, uh, and so we can continue our prototyping, our iterating between electronics and mechanical. Sometimes these enclosures um, are super simple. You know, we just need skeletal scans to hold some things together while we're iterating. We're not committing on final form. Sometimes we're modifying other people's creations uh, to fit a particular need, um, doing really uh, custom test cases and rigs for, for working with a customer on a prototype, more durable prototypes that might need um, creative ways for fastening and holding things together for, for testing in an environment that's a little bit more durable. You know, or enclosures around existing purchasable components f that people want to go print. So all of these are examples, uh, really quick enclosures, and we're going to build two today uh, along this vein and show some, some tricks on how to get there uh, really quickly. Uh, a lot of times you need a really simple enclosure around existing boards. You might be using Altium, KiCad, Mentor, Cadence, Eagle. You're grabbing boards off of GrabCAD, or you're getting open source files from Crowd Supply and generating boards. Uh, you may be getting IDF or STEP, but uh, these usually drive the shape around which um, you need to quickly build your enclosure or your test stand. So some of those are pretty, are pretty darn detailed. This is an example of uh, Raspberry Pi off GrabCAD, uh, incredibly high fidelity. Um, other times they're much lower fidelity. We're actually going to work with a a pretty lo-fi version here of a, of a Beagle and uh, work off of this 3D board that was downloaded as a step file and then we're going to work on one uh, connected with, with Eagle. Um, I like to keep this pretty interactive. Uh, interrupt me anytime, ask questions if you like. Uh, I've left a little bit of time at the end um, to talk about um, some design for manufacturing if that's interesting for folks but uh, again ask questions throughout the presentation, and I've left a little time at the end um, as well. Sound good? It's mid-afternoon, it's warm up here. I'll try and keep, keep people engaged. Uh, okay, so uh, in this particular case, uh, in Fusion, there's actually a really nice uh, way to fast track this. It's called new design from file, particularly for step data. This makes data acquisition really fast. Uh, and I'm gonna actually do all of this live, but just kind of give you the the chapters we're going to go through and then we're going to actually do it in person. Uh, that lets me load up the step file uh, into the 3D environment and from there we're going to build an enclosure, four pieces, top, bottom, two end caps and do this all in probably about seven minutes to get to the to end shape. Uh, I do have a little Julia Child's magic. I've got a couple already in the oven cooking so if we uh, are a little going a little long, long on time I'll, I'll pull those out so we can ju jump ahead. Um, make sense? Okay. So let's just uh, bounce back over. Uh, all right. I mentioned before that I had downloaded this, uh, this step file previously. Um, so I'm going to be working with this. Uh, this BeagleBone step document, that's what we're going to use to drive this first, this first enclosure. So uh, that little uh, trick is right here. We're going to just say new design from file. And that will let me go pick the step document. 
and that will read that in. Now, depending on where things come from, uh, either in the world or people's um, individual preferences, you're going to find uh, orientation of boards varies pretty wild, widely. Um, in this case, uh, this board is sitting on its side. This annoys me to no end. Um, so again, passing on a little tricks to deal with this, uh, we can fix that pretty easily. Um, right here is a simple little cube for navigating, and essentially we're not looking at this in the right orientation. So I can get it in the right orientation. Uh, that looks a little bit better, and then I'm just going to tell it, please set this view now as front, and that's going to make the orientation of my model uh, a lot more reasonable. I don't particularly care about the world axis coordinates. If we want to change that, we can, but uh, I'd prefer not to have, be looking at this model on the side with a shadow um, on the floor. So now we've got uh, some basic um, orientation fixed. You'll, you will notice that there's some pretty strange artifacts here on how the outline of the board was first generated. It's fairly faceted. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. If you're interested, we can talk later. Um, Fusion does make this pretty easy for me to fix. Um, in this particular case, I want to know what that uh, radius should have been if it wasn't faceted into elements. So we can just uh, use measure. I'm going to grab those two points and then ask it to give me the uh, elements of the vector, so it's 635. Uh, we have some nice direct editing tools where we'll just pick those. Uh, it would help if I did that as a solid. And we can just come back and make that a nice accurate corner. So we could go through if we wanted to do, do some cleanup, remove detail if we didn't want it add detail if we had it, but a nice set of tools to get in and do some, some basic cleaning up of the model. And we're going to design an enclosure on this, and I like to keep the organization of my product hierarchy really clean. Uh, so uh, we want uh, an assembly that is essentially the case, and an assembly which is essentially the PC board. And you'll notice that this is structured with all of these components loose at the root. Um, so again, for hygiene's sake, I'm going to make a new component. We'll just call that the beagle bone, grab all that other stuff that we had, and we're just going to restructure that into that subassembly, create another assembly, which is going to be our case. Now, as soon as I made that second component, it essentially activated that component for me. That means it set the scope of what I'm about to create to be inside of that component, so I can um, define where different things I create go in the hierarchy. Because this model was imported from a step file, it actually came in as just a bunch of dumb solids. There's no history here. It's data exchange between CAD tools it tends to be just uh, basic solid forms. Um, so uh, everything I want to do, I do want to maintain parametric history on that. So I need to take this document, which came in um, as just dumb solids, and tell it I want to actually capture some history based on what I'm going to do. So um, by telling it capture some capture history, it's going to reorganize all of the geometry that was imported into a series of uh, timeline steps or parametric steps. And everything I do from this point forward is going to be uh, parametric on top of uh, that geometry. And that's going to make it much easier for me to iterate on my case if people start throwing out curveballs and we want to change the model on the fly. OK, so that's, that's all just set up to get us to the point of, of actually creating the shape. Uh, we can see uh, this is a pretty simple board. It's got I.O. on either end. Um, so we're going to just do essentially a tube enclosure to in encompass this. Um, as I mentioned, two plates on the end with some openings and a clamshell for the housing to, to contain it. So uh, let's, let's bang that out really fast. Um, I said I was going to make a case. I should do that. Now we're act back and active. And this is just giving me a construction plane. Um, all throughout this presentation, you're going to hear me talk a lot about trying to keep what I generate in my enclosure as loosely coupled to the underlying board and um, ECAD geometry as possible. The fewer the references I generate to actual 
faces, edges, and components on the board, uh, the less brittle, brittle my enclosure will be. Um, that's really important, particularly if we're doing a lot of iteration between the electronics and the mechanical. We want to b bake into the enclosure design as much flexibility that the underlying electronics can change as possible. That means less rework as we're iterating with our electronics um, and our mechanics. So by putting on this uh, construction plane, I've given myself an underlying face, a work plane, a construction plane, uh, that I uh, will attach my sketch to. That gives me a level of indirection between my sketch and the underlying model. And if I'm doing lots of sketches, I'll reference this plane. That way, if my electronics change, I only have to update this one plane's position, and then all of the downstream features will rebuild appropriately. If I built lots of sketches and each of those had associated to that plane independently, if that plane had moved or disappeared, I'd have to fix every explicit reference to that face, whereas this work plane gives me that indirection and makes a, a much more robust model. And in order for iteration to go fast, we need, we need robust models. So let's uh, use that to sketch out a, a basic shape. Um, I'm going to do that with the slot tool to cheat a bit here and roughly something about Oh, that big. And I'm going to make the center line uh, horizontal so that I know I have a nice um, horizontal set of lines. And then I can just roughly size this to uh, the, the underlying board that we can look at here in profile. Maybe a little bit bigger. Okay, now the other thing that you'll notice is uh, we have a series of uh, USB ports on this side. We have a micro USB um, as well. And I'd like to have some openings in order to uh, make sure we can keep access to that. So that's just going to be two quick rectangles. Uh, I would probably spend a little bit more time uh, dimensioning and precisely positioning these, but for brevity and demo sake, we're just going to eyeball this together today. If I go fast or you would like me to explain something that maybe I'm not being explicit about, please ask me. I'm just going to quickly do one more slot. And also set that to be horizontal. All right. And that gets us a good start. Uh, we'll talk a bit about wall thickness later. I'm going to start with a one and a half mil wall on that one end cap. All right. And now we want to do the same thing on this end. I'm going to put a construction plane. I'm going to go ahead and put a sketch on that end cap and project uh, that outer boundary so we have a match. Yep. Uh, I could reuse the same sketch there. I, I'm building in a, a failure in a minute. Um, so no worries. Um, yeah, the, the, we're going to talk a, mi a, a minute about exactly why I didn't do that and why I should do that. No worries. It helps to have a, a plant in the audience. Um, OK, so then I'm also going to just do a quick uh, slot on this as well. Um, All right, so now I have two end caps. Uh, those end caps uh, give me my overall shape. Now we need the tube that's going to um, enclose all of this. Um, by doing that, I'm going to put another sketch on this face. 
And I just will reuse that outer contour. So um, in that, let me just do a, let's do a half mil on the outside. And we're going to do minus 0.5 towards the inside. And from here, I'm picking those outer profiles. Uh, we'll use that to create a new body. Uh, and we'll just tell it to go all the way to this face, plus a little bit of offset. We're going to give it about two mils of offset on that side. And on the side I'm extruding from, I picked, I started with a profile plane. I can actually tell it to add a bit of offset here. We say minus two, oops, two. Now we've created a little bit of a, of a lip. And if you saw, I did a, an offset towards the inside of the cap and an offset to the outside of the cap. Uh, that meant that's created a base, basically a half mil um, interference between these two end caps and the tube that I've just generated. Um, which is going to make my life really easy because to finish this, we'll just say, let's do a combine. This is my target object. I'm going to use that end cap as a tool, that end cap as a tool, um, and we're going to do a cut. I actually want to keep the end caps, so let's just say keep those tools. And when we say OK, we've actually cleared up those interferences to create quick grooves in the shape. And that lets us finish this really fast. I'm going to generate a mid-plane construction geometry and then use that to split a body, this tube with that face. And pretty quickly, we can crack this open, lay it flat on a bed, take the two end caps, lay it flat on a bed, hit print. Obviously, we don't have any fasteners. In this case, a really easy trick is two rubber bands. Throw it around the tube, hold it together. You've got something that's safe, easy, carry around, take the rubber bands off, take it apart. You're not dealing with any mechanical fasteners that are going to wear out. We're going to talk about mechanical fasteners in a few minutes. Um, but in this case, we've just taken a board, quickly generated a really simple uh, enclosure uh, that's cheap, fast, and easy to print, um, and is built off of the underlying geometry. Now, one of the things that I talked about was sort of this loosely coupled idea. And I'm going to demonstrate why that's a, a really important uh, idea. Um, if we were working with a board or an end cap like I had before, uh, and I want to create associativity and be smart about it, uh, what you actually reuse is really important. So in the case of where w I just made that end cap, on purpose what I had done was individually selected um, these, e these edges to project them. There are several other ways that I could have done this. Uh, an alternative might have been, and one that I would recommend in most cases, um, is to project the entire face rather, the e rather than the ed end edges. Um, there are cases where we can actually reuse the entire sketch multiple times and just uh, set the extents of the extrusion to a different place in space. Uh, but uh, what I really want to get across here is this idea of I see a lot of people go do this and start projecting points or lines individually and then making their sketch lines collinear or coincident with these sketch geometries. Their model changes and the whole thing explodes and they have to rebuild it. In this case, it's a really nice, simple example. The first sketch I created, I individually selected the, ed the edges. So I have an explicit reference between this projected line and that edge. But in this case, I projected the face. The only thing this sketch cares about is that that face survives. It does not matter how much the outer boundary of that face ever changes. This sketch is going to be much smarter because it's more loosely coupled. It's only looking for the face. And we can demonstrate that really easily by taking that one edge, deleting it completely, replacing it with as many edges as we want. enough and say finish and that's a perfect example so because it's a reference to the face it just says give me 
whatever boundary of that face is. Does not matter how much that boundary changes as long as the face survives. And faces, in most cases, are very long-lived uh, objects to reference. And you can immediately see here, it's lost its reference. That edge has been deleted. It doesn't know what to do. Um, fortunately, in Fusion, when that happens, it goes sick. It's not a hard failure. You notice it's uh, put the sketch as sick. It's shown the sketch line as being sick there's still a valid profile because it's using that sick line in order to generate a profile. So the feature that might have consumed that sketch would probably recompute, but it would also be yellow and sick to tell you that some of the underlying geometry that's referenced is, has been broken and you should fix it. Uh, but in this case, I think uh, the face projection is a, is a much smarter path to go, and we're going to show a couple, uh, couple more examples of, of doing that. So I don't think I hit seven minutes on the mark. I hit about eight and a half. But the goal was to get about seven minutes from board to first enclosure. Um, we're going to spend a little bit more time on the next iteration because we're going to build a much smarter enclosure around some, some Eagle data. So let's, let's take a look at that. Um, Eagle and Fusion have a pretty deep integration. Um, makes enclosure design a heck of a lot easier than what we just saw. Um, we're going to get accurate 3D boards out of Eagle. Um, if we spend time in, uh, in our library management, we can make this really fast. Um, particularly if you're using the same library and components, you have a favorite set that you're using all the time. Um, setting up your 3D components as managed libraries up front is going to give you huge dividends on every project you do after that. Um, you can also build in as much intelligence as you want. We're not limited to, th to constraining our thinking to just electronic components. We can create a symbol that is a whole, and we can manage that whole in the library, and we can add a standoff and a fastener to it. And so when we define the whole in the board, we can also pick a symbol that has mechanical objects already assigned to it, and when we convert that into a detailed 3D board, we'll get standoffs and fasteners. If we have power leads to a 9-volt battery hookup, while that symbol may be in the schematic very simple, and on the board that just might be two flat pads for soldering at a later date, in the managed library, we can create a very nice 3D model of leads plus a 9-volt battery holder, attach it to that package, and when we, can, when we get a 3D board out, we get a 3D board with those pads and the leads and the 9-volt battery attachment point. So you can be really creative in how you add uh, geometry to your libraries. It's also bi-directional. Board outlines and components uh, can be edited in either location. So you can edit the board, lo board outline and components in Eagle, as you're familiar. Uh, you can also edit the board outline and the components inside of Fusion. And you can pass those changes back and forth, which is going to make iteration between the two really fast and easy. It's all version managed. If you've got bad changes, you can revert them. Somebody screws something up, you can roll back in time. Uh, you get commenting uh, and markups on top of that if you're collaborating between an electrical group and a mechanical group. And you can compare versions over time so you know what's changed. Uh, the other nice thing that you get out of this is something that you can share internally with your teams, as well as you can share externally if you're having somebody quote or do external enclosure design or your customer who you may want to get early feedback from. So a bunch of, bunch of benefits out of this. Um, as I said, the workflow can start um, in one of two ways. You can start in Fusion, you can define a board boundary, you can push that outline to Eagle. Uh, in Eagle, you can get your schematic and board routing done. Uh, push that detail back into Fusion, do your enclosure. What we're going to do here is we're going to start in Eagle, we're going to push the board into Fusion as an object, extract the board outline in Fusion, do some changes, adjust component position, push those changes back to Eagle, rinse and repeat, because it's usually highly iterative if we're doing prototyping work. So again, I'm going to do all this live, but I like to give everybody kind of the, the garden path before we do it live. Uh, we're going to fire up just using a demo. Uh, I highly recommend, if you haven't looked at Eagle in a while, pull down 
version 9, it's the latest release. Right inside of there is demo 3. Everything I'm about to show you just works out of the box uh, with one of the sample files. Um, from there, once we open it up, uh, we can see the board outline, and you'll notice on the right-hand side is this little black box. You can't read it because it's washed out, but it says push to fusion. When we do that, uh, we're going to tell it we're going to create a new fusion design. I get a list of a bunch of projects in which I can store it. Um, I'm going to set that location. And then we're going to get a preview here of what uh, packages I've currently used in my board and whether those uh, components have detailed models. If they don't have detailed models, we're just going to get a bounding box and a height, very IDF-like, pretty, pretty primitive. But in this case, the standard demo Eagle library has detailed models already assigned, which is why it's a great way to try this on your own, um, so that when we go ahead and push that to Fusion, we get uh, a notification, and we get a board that looks just like this. Solid models, top and bottom uh, decals showing traces, and uh, solid model detailed components. Um, this is a live link at this point. You'll notice that in the browser, um, it's and in the timeline, it's shown as a special component. It knows that this geometry comes from Eagle, so that's a persistent relationship between the Eagle data and the Fusion data, which is where the fast enclosure and the real, real powerful stuff uh, starts to kick in. So let's walk through that and do that live. So as I mentioned, uh, you can just go right into Eagle, look at projects, uh, go into examples. We're going to find uh, tutorials, uh, demo three. Um, fire that up. Um, here's that magical button of push, push to fusion. Let me remove the link because I was practicing this earlier. And now let's push new design. It's grabbing my projects. I'm going to put this in crowd supply. Preview that I have 3D packages for all of my, my packages, my devices that I've selected. So we'll just say push. And this takes about a minute to two minutes. It's going to convert all that data, send it to Fusion, Fusion's going to read the Eagle information. It's going to generate solid models, generate a board, extract the traces, create the graphical representations of those, and uh, layer them on top. It's told me, OK, it's successfully pushed. I can go um, look at the, that data inside of Fusion. So let's switch back to Fusion. And it's already told me data in this folder has been updated. If I hit refresh, we can see um, demo three has appeared as of a few moments ago. Let's go ahead and open it. And there we go. We have, we have the whole board imported and ready to go. Um, and that gives us a, a great starting point upon which that we could start, start working. Uh, we're going to do something um, even more from scratch. We're, we'll go back to Eagle. Um, and I'm going to open up another design. So here what I've done is I've just taken some random components from another board thrown some symbols down into the schematic. I'm no electrical, uh, electronics designer. I've laid out a couple components uh, just for the sake of creating some, case, some interesting cases for us to work through. Um, created an outline, generated some holes. Uh, this has an audio jack, a micro USB, and a, a, a 9D sub connector uh, that sticks off the board, connects with some standoffs. Um, and we'll go ahead and do this as well. We'll, we'll push this as a design, create a new fusion design. I'm going to put it in the same place. Again, I've got all my packages. 
So we'll just hit push. We're going to come back and look at uh, the library side of this in a few minutes because we're going to add another component and change a library component on the fly. Everyone hanging in there? It's a little warm in here, I know. All right. When do we launch this? This is every, every, when do we launch what? When you launch your board, when do we launch on our board? Oh, when do we launch on our board? <laughs> Bill of material is pretty, pretty simple. It's four components and no, no uh, traces, no, no etching required. You sell that. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, here's our component. Oops. I may have pushed it to the wrong place. Printables. Thank you, Matt. And there it is. Oh, uh, that's demo three. I named this right there. Now, one of the things that's going to look a little funny with this board is there's some big blocks on it. And those big blocks are where a bunch of the secret sauce in making uh, enclosures really easy. So um, you can essentially see uh, the my upcoming project that I will be launching on Crowd Supply, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but we don't have an enclosure for it yet, so we, we've got to get that done here um, pretty quick. So let's talk about what those big, those big blocks are. Um, if we come back here, um, as I said, we'll bounce back to manage libraries in a minute. Um, what I've actually done is added extra detail inside of the components that I published to the library. Um, normally, we'd have an audio jack, and we might think of that as just being the audio jack by itself. Um, but in this case, what I've actually done is put a sketch on that component infusion. I've extruded a cylinder that's roughly the region that needs to be kept clear for the audio cable in order to interface with the jack. So I'm essentially modeling negative space. And if I add my keep outs or my negative space to my 3D components, every board that I populate comes with keep outs pre-populated um, so that the only thing I need to do is throw a box around it, subtract the keep outs, and I have essentially a functioning enclosure. Um, so this shortcuts a bunch of that work of me sketching openings that you saw me do on the board that I imported from a step model. So we'll bounce back and do exactly that. Uh, we need a little a little room off the bottom, so we'll give it maybe six mil off the bottom, and in this case, a sketch. Uh, I'm going to project the face and use that to define a boundary. Now again, I can sit here and wonder how thick of a wall am I going to need? Well, depending on how I fabricate this, I might be doing it additively, so my wall thickness we'll talk about in a few minutes is a function of the size of the nozzle on the printer I'm going to produce it on, uh, because we want uh, an even number of beads laid down per wall thickness. If I'm going to injection mold this, then I've got uh, design for manufacturability constraints that I need to worry about, um, given what type of material I'm going to injection mold, and if I'm going to machine it, again, I have different constraints. So rather than designing my intent around uh, the thickness of the wall, I'm going to actually make that, uh, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to model, again, the negative space. How much volume do I want around my board independent of what the wall thickness is? Uh, so in that case, I just need to add a couple quick dimensions. Uh, so in the, on this end, I want to keep a pretty tight tolerance, so we'll just say half a millimeter. On this end, we'll do the same. And I can type in 0.5, but again, I'd like smart models. So in Fusion, anytime you're editing a dimension, you can go to any other dimension that's visible in the canvas and just click on it, and it creates a relationship between the two. So now if I change the first, the second will automatically uh, match. We can have a little more space on the sides. So we'll put 2 mil on that side. 
And once again, we'll just tie those two together. And we're going to extrude this sketch profile. And I can just uh, window select all these interior regions. And we'll make a quick, oh, about that big. That doesn't even need to be that good enough. And I'd like a little extra contouring to make this interesting. Okay, so that gives me a very rough box, um, but I said this is just the negative space. So now uh, I'm going to tell it I want to do a shell. Uh, I'm going to shell this whole box rather than shelling to the inside, which you might be more familiar with. I'm going to shell outward and give it one and a half mil wall thickness. So I've modeled a negative volume and I'm using that now to drive, drive a wall thickness of a plastic part around it. That way, Anytime I want to change the wall thickness universally around this component, I just go to the shell, change one variable, and I get uni universal, uniform wall thickness around, around the entire, in, entire design. That also then lets me, we see our keepouts. Uh, we'll just go ahead and say, let's, uh, well, let's add a little more detail on here. Um, round off some edges. Now we're going to do a combine, as we saw before. This is my target. I want that keep out removed. I want that keep out removed. I would like that keep out removed. And uh, one thing I find a lot of folks who get new to U Fusion uh, are not familiar with a tool uh, sometimes called select other or select behind in other CAD tools in Fusion. You just click and hold the left mouse button down any times highlight, anything's highlighted. Um, while it's still highlighted, you can just move your cursor up and down. It'll grab all of the faces and edges behind your cursor. Um, if you go to the Parents tab, you can walk the occurrence tree up the model. Um, so I actually want the whole body because then I can just press V for visibility and toggle it off. Uh, grab this body visibility and toggle it off and grab this body, toggle it off. Now we can clean up this up in a few minutes um, because, well, let's clean it up now. Um, we did this combine and obviously we didn't have enough clearance um, in order to create uh, an opening. Uh, so this is where uh, working fast and iterating is great. I just have that sketch. Uh, I'm going to pull that line up a little bit. It rebuilds, it reshells, it recombines, and I've now created uh, clearance through my model. So uh, I'm, I've built in intelligence and uh, editability into my model um, without, by not dimensioning that sketch line. I can just drag stuff around. And uh, I w we need to split it, right? We have to be able to get inside of this thing. So let's just throw quickly an access through an area that will be easy to define a parting line and a plane edit angle. And we'll do exactly what you saw before. Uh, split the body using that plane and now we have a nice simple quick enclosure. But uh, we're not done. There's a bunch of changes that are still going on. Um, so we're going to actually go back to Eagle and make some edits. So let's close these documents, go right back into Eagle, and we're going to take our D sub, flip it, and we're going to move that out and move that to the side. So a bunch of changes have happened. Um, components have moved, orientation, position. Uh, so we want those changes back in Fusion telling us we're out of sync, we need to do an update. Let's just push it and say okay. What do you think is going to happen? Bork. Bork? <laughs> <laughs> Blue screen? <laughs> yep. 
Uh, the very first model I went through was a solid model imported via step. Um, and that would be typically how you'd get KiCad data and you'd export a solid model and then bring it in. So obviously with that, in, with that set up, you're working off of just imported geometry. Um, this relies on a very deep integration of the data between Eagle and Fusion, which I'm about to show you how deep that actually goes. Uh, which what I just did, I just pushed it back and forth and actually without even open, so, so I, I closed that model on purpose in Fusion. Nothing was open in Fusion. The model was not open. There's no, there's no uh, uh, smoke and mirrors here. Uh, the model got updated and I'm just going to go to the, the view of the, the data that's stored in the project. So when we push the data to Eagle, that went into the service behind the scenes that ties Fusion and Eagle together. It updated the location of all of the components that were there. It then rebuilt the Fusion model automatically, um, including the position of those components. So uh, you didn't see me do rebuild. I didn't say update parametric features anywhere. But if I look at the web view, we see all of the components have moved and are in the right position. Even this has updated and changed its position. So the integration between the two goes way further than just a data exchange of solid models. Eagle's actually editing Fusion's core data. It's changing the parametric models inside of the Fusion storage so that you can have a super deeply integrated uh, collaboration between the two. And that goes both directions. Uh, we're going to come back into Fusion and we'll open that up. And we'll see uh, that we're missing a hole. There's a component that was, uh, that was moved and we should have seen we should have seen it opening, but we didn't because it wasn't moved close enough to the edge. So it tried, my keep out wasn't big enough. It tried to move it, uh, it did move it, but it didn't have enough room or space to, to, to make that work. So I can fix that. I'm going to go into uh, the PC board feature and from here I'm allowed to move components. So I'm gonna just grab uh, that uh, USB mount I'm gonna just do a quick shift of position. Make sure I grab the right one. This guy, move component. Okay, it's shifted down as I exit, rebuilds, now we have an opening. So I, f I fixed the mistake. So we're gonna get into a two-way loop. I've changed the component. Um, I'm going to save this because I've made a correction. It's a good question. I'm going to go back to Eagle and pretty soon here Eagle's going to say the board is out of date with respect to the mechanical. So now what I'm going to do is pull those component positions back from Fusion into Eagle. Um, obviously a small change like this, the the route probably is fine. You know, if I'd radically change things, I probably need to rip some stuff up and reroute yeah, um, so the traces. Just a, just a couple of kind of yeah. points on that. So, so um, today it will actually track the track, yeah. track the track with it. Yeah. But in the next release of Eagle, which is uh, probably six weeks away, we added 45 and 93 tracks on all those things. So it, it, they'll maintain the rough track analysis yeah. as far as the drag is concerned. Yep. And then the next step. And I, I had some failures built in on purpose to show, show this because that move that the, me the mechanical guy's done, he's borked the, the electronics now. I'm, I'm violating a live design rule here and it's showing me that uh, with, a, with a red hatching that I'm too close to the edge. So, but uh, the whole point here is to actually show that there's, this is now so tightly coupled that these types of iterations between the electronics and the mechanical become effectively pretty painless. Um, 
and the more intelligence you build into your library and the uh, uh, loosely coupling modeling techniques that we've talked, a few of the techniques we've talked about here mean that those models will, will survive all sorts of interesting edits um, and changes, which is what we want. We want to be able to, to be prototyping and making changes and not feel like the fact that models blow up prevent us from being creative or, ex or experimenting. We want fast, quick enclosures and highly iterative experience. So um, hopefully that, that gets us there. Yep. So you'll notice everything that's happened here, a uh, notification goes off, and then I, I explicitly say, now I want to pull. So um, Fusion and, in, and Eagle, in this case, all, both have a kind of pull model. will tell you if there's something changed, and then you pull when you want it. That way mm -hmm. you're not dealing with any simultaneous uh, borking on, <laughs> on an ongoing basis. You can wait. Yes, um, there is some tools inside both to tell you precedence. So uh, even on the Fusion side, I can show that really, really easily. Uh, when we go in, we can look at things and say, what, you know, what the heck's going on? Where's the board shape? What's changed at any given point? Um, if there's conflict, whose shape do I want to use right now? Do I want to use the Eagle board shape or the, the Fusion shape? At some point, you're going to have to reconcile your edits. Um, but there are some safety tools in there to first tell you what's going on because that can be a little disconcerting, not knowing what's happening. And to, uh, to the point of pulling, you can kind of tell it which way to prefer to be at a given moment in time. Um, yes? The mental model is pretty, pretty similar. Um, uh, we're dealing with versions, um, so we might call them, uh, you know, and these things are discrete domains, so we might even say they're like submodules. Um, we're referencing each other at a version level. We're not referencing um, at a commit, you know, every transaction. And then we choose when we want to pull a, a major version between them. That's even true for Fusion's assembly environment. Um, if you've used Inventor or SolidWorks or others, they tend to open what's known as latest. So whatever the latest version of every item is in your team's project, when you open, it will grab the latest of everything. Fusion actually uh, is an as-saved behavior. Because everything's versioned, it opens the versions at the time of save and then tells you if new items are available and you can pull them individually or in mass. Um, so it's a bit more explicit about pulling uh, change between domains, both inside of Fusion and between Eagle and Fusion. Um, that means a lot less surprises when you save something and you come back tomorrow and you open it, you opened it as it was saved and then you're told if there's any changes and you pull them. And it makes it a lot easier to uh, absorb change and understand what, what happened. Um, and this can get, can get uh, quite sophisticated. So um, fortunately, if I go back to my crowd supply folder, um, there I, w I was sharing with Josh when this first work worked about nine months ago. Um, the health pie guys were really nice to put up the board and schematic from Eagle directly. Uh, I extracted that, created a library, added some 3D components, um, and that produced this automatically. Um, so I was able to now get a highly detailed uh, board of all of the components, um, solder mask, labeling. Uh, I showed you a Raspberry Pi 3, throw these things two together, and we're off to the races building, building an associative enclosure between the two. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm going to happily share this presentation. There's a bunch of content that goes through. I'm going to backtrack here. In order to create a managed library, you can take any one of your Eagle library files. You go to library.io, you upload it. Once it goes there, you're able to see all of the packages and footprints. Um, from there, you can go to any one of your packages and you'll see the, 
the generic sort of IDF-ish bounding box that's generated based on generic size data. Uh, we can go ahead and tell it we want to upload a step or OBJ file. Uh, you get some tools to do refinement of positioning on top of the footprint. Uh, we'll then save that you know, back to our library. Uh, that updates my managed library. Uh, the only thing you need to do then is back in Eagle, pop open the library manager. You're going to see um, in the library manager a little, it's a little hard to see here, I apologize. It has like the recycling symbol, which basically says your local, uh, your local Eagle library is not up to date with your managed library. Just hit update that'll sync your local library file to your managed library. Um, and at that point, your, your symbol is updated with the 3D package. Um, pretty straightforward to go through and do that. It makes a nice uh, centrally located place where you can upload all of your commonly used Eagle libraries. Um, if you're in there and you realize you don't have access to uh, a model, one of the things that's really handy, uh, let's just go take a quick look at this, um, is there are component generators there for a bunch of common components already. So if we've got an IC or surface mount, um, we can pull that up. Hopefully if I haven't gone to sleep here. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, let's just get to it from here. Let's just go ahead and hit packages and say create a new package. Because I can do that, I can fire that up right from, from the home page. So now we've got a list of, of common components. Um, grab one of these, paste in your spec sheet information, update your preview, and it's going to generate the footprint, it's going to generate the 3D model, and we have a, a 3D component ready to go. Hold tight. And there we are. So. Uh, lots of uh, 3D library parts all over the web that you can grab, but a bunch of them you can auto-generate right from, from the library page. and pull it down and reuse it. Yeah. Yeah. Next um. week, I think next week, this week, we'll <laughs> So in the, in the presentation when we're talking about enclosures, uh, I can't, as a mechanical engineer, I cannot resist spending a little bit of time by talking about design for manufacturability. Um, I've covered basically three really common enclosure paths. So if you're 3D printing, it's really good to understand uh, layer orientation and the fact that these are non-isotropic materials and they behave differently depending on the direction of load. So some basic things to understand about um, how the way you print affects the strength of the material. Um, the orientation you print in will affect the shape of the holes that you produce. Overhangs around round holes will often cause a little bit of sag. Uh, that can cause the holes also to elongate because of resonance in the mechanical system. What you might have thought was a nice engaged round hole will print as an oval and you'll wonder why your fasteners are pulling out. So uh, just be warned. Uh, FDM printing or FFF printing has some, some special considerations. Again, um, when you're dealing with lateral loads, you can find delamination if you're not careful about providing gusseting or ribbing. Um, and make sure you have enough, per per enough perimeters when you're printing to take how, whatever sized uh, thread that you're trying to put into it. One thing I highly recommend everybody do if they're going to be printing, the more upfront work you do, the better dividends you get later on. This is a super easy thing to do. It's a sketch. It's five rectangles. Uh, the first rectangle is I'm printing with a 0.35 nozzle. Um, that usually means I'm printing with a bead width of about 0.42 millimeters. So the first rectangle is 0.42 wide. The second one is times two. The third is times three. The fourth is times five. And the fifth is, uh, uh, fourth is times four. And the fifth is times five. Then you can extrude that one or two millimeters, send it to your slicer of choice. 
uh, and you can see directly what the result of various different wall thicknesses will produce. Uh, I cannot tell you the number of times I see people complain. I'm trying to print this and there's a gap between my two perimeters. Or I'm trying to print this and my printer is shimmering itself off the table because it's trying to go do that zigzag pattern down the middle. A little bit of work to tune your nozzle width to extrusion, your nozzle diameter to extrusion width to wall thickness and set that up. Once you know what it is for your printer, you can avoid all of those cases. This just takes a minute to do um, and will pay you back hours of headaches uh, later in life. So uh, highly recommended. On injection molding, there's a bunch of basic things to realize. Junctions cause thicker material. Thicker material cools differently. You get sink marks. If those are visible, they are ugly. If they're not visible, it's up to you to decide if you want to ship it that way. Um, some, so there's some basic tips here about uh, DFM around uh, uh, plastics. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, non-conventional clips that I realize uh, not everyone's familiar with. So I've given some really simple examples of uh, clips that uh, engage in and out um, or engage differently and release differently depending on the way you would like to work. Um, one of the uh, best tips I can give anybody trying to do cheap and fast is oftentimes people model this. But if it's on the bottom of an enclosure, all it requires is a standoff and a hole through the bottom and there's no slide. And this will take a $50,000 tool and turn it into a $15,000 tool because there's no slides required. So the fewer sides that you have undercuts from, the less work required. This is super cheap way to uh, build in some smarts into uh, a molded component. Again, there's uh, lots of times people go to fasteners. Some general tips that you can read about on fasteners, including pros and cons about using fasteners for enclosures. And lastly, on two and a half axis machining, undercuts are a no-no. The more sides you have to work the part from, the more expensive the part is going to be. Just some basic understanding. Some general guidelines around diameter, radiuses of internal corners relative to depths of features. When you start exceeding these rules, your costs will go up exponentially with a manufacturing or prototyping house. That includes depth of holes relative to diameters of holes. So hopefully it gives you a few quick rules of thumb that you can incorporate into your enclosures and that avoids some surprises if you're manufacturing through any of these methods. Um, and there I am, one minute over the clock. So hopefully it was useful. Thank you very much.